author Becky Marietta. Becky's works of fiction, poetry, and essays have appeared in such publications as Bosk, 3288 Review, Weber, The Contemporary West, and others. A resident of Northeast Oklahoma, Becky teaches English at John Brown University and writes fiction to escape the sometimes grim reality of grading composition papers. White River Red is Becky's first novel. Tonight, she'll share a short history of the real White River Red and talk a little bit about where the idea for her novel came from. She'll also be um, taking questions at the end of her talk. And if you didn't notice on your way in, there's books for sale out front and she'll be also uh, doing a book signing for you. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Becky. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Renee, and thank you for the Fayetteville Library for um, hosting this event. And thank you, those of you who came out tonight. It's, it's, it's fun to see human beings not behind a screen. So <laughs> I appreciate you taking some time out of your evening to come join me. Um, so um, as Renee mentioned, this is my first novel. And one of the questions that I get asked the most, can you guys hear me OK? because I can talk louder. Um, one of the questions I get asked the most are, oh, you wrote a novel. Where'd you get your idea? That's like number one. The second question is, how did you get a publisher <laughs> from all those aspiring writers? So I'm going to address the first question tonight. If you've got questions about the publisher, sign up for my newsletter. It's free um, out, outside, and I try to talk about writing things for people who are interested. Query letters, sometimes writing about fiction, my journey to finding a publisher and that type of thing. So if you're interested, please sign up. It's, it's supposed to be a monthly newsletter, I will be honest. Um, it's usually more of a bi-monthly newsletter. You definitely won't get over inundated with emails from me. <laughs> so um, if you're interested in that, go ahead and sign up. So, why did I write this book, or how, how did I get the idea for the book? Um, um, my grandparents are from this area, were from this area, um, Springdale and in Prairie Grove. And my pa, that's what we called him, Fred Stamps, who lived in Bethel Heights, about Arkansas back in the day especially around this area. So one of my favorite things to do was to get him talking. I'd sit down and say, hey, Pa, what story do you have for me today? And one time he said, well, did I ever tell you about White River Red? And I said, no, that, that sounds interesting. Tell me about White River Red. So he started telling me some off-color stories that I'm not going to repeat here um, in public, but um, he basically summed it up that she was a rough old gal his words, that would stomp around town wearing men's overalls and a, and a old leather hat, and he swore, and she swore like a sailor. So, and this was at a time period when women were supposed to be a little bit more ladylike and didn't dress in that way and didn't say those things. And so, but he said what was most interesting about her is while she had this very scary persona, she was also known to be very generous, um, and she didn't like people to know about it. If she found out that a family was in need, um, couldn't pay the utility bills, she would go into the utility office, and she would dig out a wad of cash from her pocket, because she did not believe in banks, and she would pay that family's utility bill. Or she found out someone was hungry, so she'd show up with big bag loads of groceries for them. Um, and she would get real angry if anybody ever tried to thank her. Because she would say, don't, don't thank me. This is not something to be thanked for. Um, so I found her to be such an intriguing character. And so I thought, well, she's very interesting. So I went to my grandpa. My, my pa is my mom's dad. Um, my dad's dad, Ira Lewis from Prairie Grove. I said, hey, grandpa. I said, do you have any stories about White River Red? And he went, White River Red. And my grandmother gave him a look. And he shut his mouth. And he did not tell me any stories <laughs> about White River Red. Now, I will say that was the Baptist side of the family. So maybe the stories were a little bit too racy for his uh, granddaughter. But so, so that was when I first just sort of heard these stories about White River Red and thought, oh, she's, that sounds interesting. And then I kind of put it away. And then about 
uh, I don't know, probably 10 years later, both my grandparent and my grandpas had passed, uh, passed on. Um, Shiloh Museum over in Springdale um, had uh, an event in the newspaper where they invited local people to come and share their stories about White River Red. And I went, oh, I remember my grandpa's talking about that. I got to go to this. So I went um, and spent a delightful afternoon um, with people who were um, much older than me. I was by far the youngest person in there and they just had these great stories and even though at that time I wasn't consciously ready to write a book, I found myself taking copious notes the entire time. Um, and as I left that event I thought it's sad that this interesting character who lived this almost made for movies life is going to disappear from memory when those people in that room pass away because they carry with her really the only memories. And I thought, I wonder, I wonder if her story is out there at all, if anybody has ever heard anything else about her. So um, I started digging around and the only research I could find was by uh, the late Philip Steele. Um, he was a local historian of the Ozarks. He wrote these great books, if you have a chance to pick up some of his works. He wrote these great works about famous outlaws and their connection to Arkansas, Arkansas tales. Like he, was, he, he wrote about Arkansas. Um, and so um, about, I, I would say, six or seven years after her death, um, he decided to see if he could figure some stuff out about White River Red. So he started doing some interviews. Remember, this was, would have been, what, 1979? Um, so it was before the internet. It was before, you know, he, he, all of his interviews were, he had to go find someone and sit down and talk to them and find out what they knew about White River Red. Um, microfiche, you know, newspaper articles, that kind of thing. So he did the hard work and all the research he got out of it was a seven page booklet <laughs> that he self published. Um, and um, so um, I, I, read, I, I managed to find this out of print booklet in a used bookstore in Fort. if I turned this real character into fiction. Because everybody likes stories. So I thought, okay, I'm, this is what I do. I write fiction anyway. I'm going to take the things I know about her and then I'm going to embellish and create character. I'm going to create motivation. My story will have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It will have themes. And so that's how the idea came about. Um, I, I, I took all of that, that information and I turned it into fiction. So this story has real aspects. There are real characters, but there are also a lot of characters I made up and how Florestina felt about certain things and why she behaved the way she did. That was all my invention. Um, so uh, a little bit about the real um, White River Red. Her real name was Florestina Bradley Campbell. And here's a picture of her with one of her goats. She loved animals. Um, and this is, would obviously be in her older, older days. Here's some, some facts, facts as far as interviews and, and memory can, can uh, be facts. She ran away from home in 1906 when she was 15 years old and she joined the circus, which feels like a cliche, but it was a cliche because a lot of kids did that. Um, she came from a, a wealthy family and there's no, again, no, no reason given as to why she ran away to join the circus, so I invented a reason. Um, she was in the circus for a while. Um, she was a trapeze artist and then um, a tragedy occurred and she had to leave this circus. Um, and so she started working carnivals. And a lot of people remember her even still working at the Tawny Town Grape Festival. Um, she was remembered because her carnival game was very unique. She had a rat game. She had three live rats, a brown rat, a black rat, and a white rat. And this colored wheel with colors and numbers. And as far as I can understand, you would bet which color rat would go into which colored circle, and if you were
Um, but a lot of people remember her hands being scarred from all the rat bites, having to deal with those rats all the time. Um, she met and um, common law married a man named Jack Campbell and they bought a bar out on the White River. She had bright red hair and so that's where she got this title, White River Red, because she lived out there on, on the White River. Um, someone questioned me one time and said, was that a brothel? And I said, all the research I have been able to find, I could not find any evidence it was a brothel. It was more like they had fiddle, fiddling on Saturday nights and dances. Um, and so she sort of lived on the fringes, lived life on her own terms. Um, then later on, um, at the end of her life, she died destitute and alone in a nursing home. Um, so poor that there wasn't even a uh, tombstone for her for her grave. Now, when Mr. Steele wrote this book and self-published it, he sold it and saved the money, and then they brought in some what they call they called themselves friends of Forestina, and they raised enough money to erect a um, tombstone for her um, about what seven years after her death, um, and it, it, she's buried over at Friendship Cemetery over here in Springdale. Um, she's buried in the same um, cemetery as my pa and my, my nanny and many of my relatives. But what's, what's great about this is if you go to visit, if you want a field trip and go visit her grave, you have no problem finding it because it's the only one that has a trapeze artist, a big top, an elephant, um, a carousel. And you can't see because I put the flowers here, but right here in the corner, there's actually a rat on her on her tombstone. So it's easy to find that tombstone. Um, so um, that, that, that was where I start, sort of started with her. Um, after I decided, OK, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to write this. I also started doing research on the American cir uh, Circus. You know, 6 to 1973 is a huge stretch of time, and there are a lot of things that we have now that they didn't have back then. And so I was constantly running to Google to say, you know, did they have scotch tape in 19... I don't know. So I wanted this to be as realistic as possible. So I did a lot of research on the American circus and, and just life in America during this time period so that it would have this flavor of reality. Um, it's funny because I had a, a dear woman send me a message on my author page. I have an author page on Facebook if you want to follow it. Um, and she messaged me and she said, I read your book. I loved your book. She said, I thought everything just rang so true except for one thing. She said, you mentioned an armadillo in the book. And she said, did they have armadillos in Arkansas at that time? And I thought, Huh? Like, I've always assumed Arkansas had armadillos. <laughs> it never crossed my mind that they weren't just part of the Arkansas soil. I mean, there's that old joke, what do you do if you get lost in the woods in Arkansas? Started researching, and thank goodness, I, first of all, I thought, when did I even mention an armadillo? Like, it was... Literally, the armadillo wrestle, it must have been an armadillo wrestling in the woods. That's all I said, and this woman honed in on that. So I looked it up. Thank goodness I dodged a bullet there because my, when I made the mention, it was 1935, and they actually started appearing in Arkansas in 1921. So, whew, it taught me a little something about no matter how careful you are about your research, someone is going to know something that you weren't prepared for, and they're going to challenge you on that. So um, I, I love that kind of stuff. I love that kind of stuff, because I would have never thought to look when armadillos came to um, uh, to, to our. To read just a short chapter, if that's OK with you guys. Um, this chapter is sort of in the middle of the, of the book. Um, Forestina has left the, the circus, and she's sort of in a holding pattern in her life at this part of the book. And it's, it's sort of the catalyst for the next chapter. 
Um, before I move on, I have to point out these little darling things here. My daughter, who is just amazing, I have two kids and they're just amazing, but my daughter, um, she quickly crocheted these things up for me um, to give me as a gift when I when I published my book. This is for Estina when she was a young woman at the circus with her long, beautiful hair and her tutu with pearls sewn in. And then this is for Estina when she became White River Red with her hat, her cowboy hat and her overalls and her chopped off hair. So this is, a, if you're wondering what those are, those were a, my favorite gift. Okay, um, so, Poor Estina, she's in a holding pattern. So this is interlude, this is chapter 12, uh, 1914. Forestina wandered through the carnival, winding her way back and forth through the rows and rows of booth, taking in the heat and excitement. As she approached the test your strength tower, she paused to watch the barker in charge of the game do his thing. He was tall, over six feet, Forestina guessed, and heavily built like a lumberjack and he sported an impressive brushy red-brown beard to boot. In each of his big hands, he held the rubber-headed mallets that were used to strike the game's pad, twirling them in slow arcs as if they weighed nothing. Spotting Forestina, he offered one of the handles to her. Want to test your strength, little lady? He asked. There's a quarter in it for you if you hit hard enough to ring the bell. A man standing in the small knot of people surrounding the game guffawed. How could that little bitty thing hit the bell? She's no bigger than a fly. Don't waste your nickel, girl, he advised. He winked at her. I got a better game for you. It's called Find the Weasel. It's in my pants. You can play for free. Forestina cast a long measuring look at the pale, clean-shaven, ferret-eyed Rube. He was the type of guy who would come into her cafe and argue that a little squeeze of her bottom was an expected side dish to the coffee she poured and don't even think about him leaving a tip. She hated him on sight. Reaching with her right hand into the small beaded change purse attached by a velvet cord to her left wrist, she pulled out one shiny new nickel. Holding it high for all to see, pinched between thumb and forefinger, she offered it to the huge bear of a man running the game. As he held his giant palm out for her to drop the nickel into, she smiled at him sweetly and leaned forward. Where's the sweet spot, she whispered, trying not to move her lips as she did so. And where's the dummy mallet, the one I can actually swing? He stood back and examined her from top to bottom, a slow grin of admiration spreading across his face. She noticed that between his mustache and beard were straight, very white teeth and a pair of rather shapely lips. He handed her the mallet in his left hand. Let me show you how to lift it and swing, he said loudly. He put one hand beneath her elbow and with the other hand lifted the long wooden neck of the mallet, his fingers gripping below where she held it in both of her hands. As he stood close to her, he murmured in her ear, upper right corner, just above the pad, make it look good. He released her and stepped away. Forestina let the mallet drop suddenly, her body bending as if the sheer weight was too much for her. She dragged the head of it, in truth it weighed no more than a croquet mallet, through the dirt and positioned herself in front of the slim rectangular sign that stretched above her some six feet. It was divided by such scientific strength assessments as puny at the bottom, kid sister, preteen boy, now you're growing up, and finally at the top near the steel bell, strong man, you win. As she gazed upwards, she swallowed hard. That bell seemed very far away. The rube who had started all of this jeered at her. Really, what a waste, he called out. She can't even pick the hammer up. He stepped forward, reaching for the mallet. Why don't, let you, you, why don't you let me take care of that for you, sweetie, he asked, his beady eyes glittering like a snake's. The carnival barker stepped in. Back off, buddy, her nickel, her swing. The rube opened his mouth as if to argue, then his eyes seeming to take in the size of the man in front of him, decided to think better of it. Suits me, he shrugged. I'm happy to watch her make a fool of herself. Forestina resisted an urge to use the mallet to smash him in the face. Taking a deep breath, she lifted the hammer above her head, pretending that it took all of her strength to do so, and then let it drop exactly where the barker had said. As she did, she moved to her right, blocking the view of the spectators just slightly so that they could not see where the blow landed. The black disc inside the glass casing of the sign shot straight up and smacked the bell with a resounding ding, and the crowd, minus one of course, cheered. 
The barker raised his remaining mallet over his head. Way to go, miss, he said. Take a bow. He nodded at the crowd and winked at her. <clears throat> she obeyed, sweeping her arms and skirts out wide, curtsying first right and then left. As she distracted the rubes, she saw the barker bend down to pick up the light mallet she dropped. He deftly tossed it under the low-sheeted platform they were standing on, then just as deftly pulled out a different mallet. He straightened, dug into his pocket, and produced a quarter. Here you go, missy, he said, handing it to her. She accepted it with a beatific smile. The carnival barker addressed the crowd. So, who's next? Who wants to try Jack Campbell's game of strength? Who has the courage to try their skill after this Amazonian creature showed us all how it's to be done? The crowd laughed, obviously enjoying the joke that the tiny redhead in front of them could be deemed Amazonian. Forestina hammed it up, flexing her biceps at them. Come on, the man said, don't let old Jack down. Is there no one in the crowd willing to represent the male of the species? He pointed to the obnoxious rube from before. How about you, he asked. You sure were saying a lot before. You think you can do as well as this little girl? The rube scowled and his friends standing with him started their taunts. Yeah, come on, Mark, one man said, show us something. Jack placed his booted foot on a stool that stood nearby. How about we make it interesting, he said to Mark, 50 to one that you can't hit that bell. Before Mark could answer, Forestina held her newly won quarter up in the air. Jack, is it? She asked, addressing the man running the game. He nodded. I would also like to lay a bet. Is that allowed? Jack stroked his beard. It's a free country, he said. What did you have in mind? Forestina turned to Mark, who was watching her with his washed out snaky eyes. I bet you my two bits to yours that you can't do better than me, she said. The crowd hooted in appreciation of her pluck. I'll lay a bet against that, a friend of Mark said. He pulled out a quarter too. Mine against yours that Mark will hit that bell in one try. Other people in the crowd started to pull their money out as well, hollering to join the betting. Obviously convinced that if Forestina could hit the bell, surely a man would have no problem. Jack held up his right hand, palm out. Okay, okay, he said, voice raised to be heard over the clamor. He reached into his back pants pocket and pulled out a small wire-bound notebook and a pencil. He noted down everyone's bet, then said, okay, bets are closed. If Mark hits that bell, we divide the winnings between you all. If he doesn't, he shrugged, then it gets split between me and, he raised an eyebrow at her, and she said, Forestina. Forestina, lovely name for a lovely woman, he commented, scribbling again on his pad of paper. Before handing Mark a mallet, Jack said casually, I noticed you didn't put any money up against the lady. You need to fork a quarter over, bud. Flushing, Mark dug into his front pants pockets and pulled out two dimes and a nickel. Here, he grumbled, shoving the coins towards Jack, who calmly added it to the pile of silver in his hand. He jotted, Mark's name, jotted down Mark's name with a flourish. Come on, come on, Mark said. I ain't all, got all day. Impassively, Jack held out both mallets to Mark. You want to pick which one to swing with, he asked. Mark grabbed for both of them, and when Jack let go, he was pulled downwards by the weight, almost falling over. The crowd laughed, and he flushed again. Dropping one of the mallets, he lined himself up and lifted his arms overhead, swinging down as hard as he could on the center of the square black pad, grunting with the effort. The disc inside the glass rose all the way to kid sister. The crowd of people clapped and jeered, seeming to forget that most of them had just lost money. Jack put a sympathetic paw on Mark's shoulder. Ah, brother, he said, tough luck. He turned to the crowd. I think our man here was just warming up. What do you say? Shall we call that a practice run and let him try again? They all clapped their assent. Mark snarled, let me use the other mallet. Jack handed it to him, and Mark breathed out heavily before raising it overhead with both hands and slamming it down on the black square. Kid sister, the sign informed him again flatly. Amid the new burst of laughter, Forestina cupped her hands around her mouth and called out, why didn't you bring a real man to help with, uh, with you to help you, kid sister? Bellowing with rage, Mark flung the handle of the mall mallet down. You stupid broad, he spat out at Forestina. There's no way you could have hit that bell. Understanding slowly dawned on his ugly face. Unless the game is rigged and you're a part of it, he raised his fist and took a step forward. I ought to knock your teeth out. The crowd fell silent as Forestina dug her heels in and lifted her chin. No matter what, she was not going to flinch away. She'd sooner die. 
Before he could unload on her, though, Jack reached over, almost casually, and lifted Mark by the scruff of his neck. Now you listen to me, buddy, he said in a pleasant, conversational tone. You apologize to this sweet gal, and then you take your sorry self away from my carnival and don't come back. If I see you here again, I promise you that I will stomp you into a mud hole. Are we clear? When Mark didn't answer right away, Jack shook him gently, like a cat shaking a naughty kitten. Are we clear? he asked again. Yes, Mark stammered. Good, Jack said. He sat Mark back on his feet and gestured in Forestina's direction. Well, go ahead, he said. Mark swallowed hard. I apologize, he said through grinding teeth, eyes fixed on the ground like a chastened schoolboy. Forestina set her hands on her hips and leaned forward. Mister, she said sweetly, batting her eyelashes, you and your apology can go straight to the devil. She turned her heels and flounced away, the roars of appreciation from the crowd ringing in her ears. She walked along slowly, not really seeing the bustle of people around her, lost in an old daydream of cheers in a circus tent. After a few moments, she heard heavy, rapid footsteps coming out behind her. Hey, miss, Miss Forestina with the pretty hair and the pretty name. She slowed and turned to see Jack hurrying after her. He was waving two closed fists overhead. Half of this belongs to you, he panted once he caught up to her. He pushed a pile of coins into her hands. She considered them for a moment, then shoved them into her skirt pocket. It was a pleasure doing business with you, Jack, she said, smiling at him. Thanks for keeping that jerk in line. She turned to go, but he caught her hand. Wait, he said. Her eyes narrowed as she looked pointedly down at the hand clasping her, and he hastily let her go, holding his palms out. Easy, he said. I just wanted to ask you which carnival outfit you're with. I thought we were the only ones scheduled for Lawrence this month. What makes you think I'm with a carnival, Forestina asked, pleased that he had figured out that she wasn't just a run-of-the-mill rube. Well, you knew about the sweet spot, and you knew about the dummy mallet. Also, you grifted that crowd but good, staggering around and pretending the mallet was almost too heavy to carry. He whistled admiringly. That was a nice piece of acting right there. They started to walk along at a nice, comfortable pace, Jack shortening his steps to accommodate the difference in their height. He nudged her gently with his elbow. Come on, he said, fess up. No carnival, she replied, circus. No kidding, Jack said, which one? Bringling, Forestina replied. Though our circus would have never tolerated cons, but I know someone who played people easier than a baby plays pat a cake, and he taught me all the tricks he knew. She frowned. Of course, his best one was how to disappear. So he wasn't a con man, he was a magician, Jack said. Aren't they the same thing? Forestina asked, feeling tired and suddenly ready to return to her solitary room in Mrs. Crawford's boarding house. Jack didn't seem ready to let her go, however. So why did you leave, he asked, and what do you do now? Haven't I seen you working at Jolene's diner? Man, their pies are something else. The butterscotch makes me want to slap my pappy. Forestina cackled at that. Shoot, I haven't heard that expression since I was a little tyke in Louisiana, she said, before we moved to Missouri. Jack grinned down at her. Louisiana, then Missouri, then all around Ringling, and now here in Kansas. He nudged her with his elbow. Keep talking and I'll have your life story pieced together in no time. Forestina stiffened. She had sworn off con men, even cheerful, friendly ones like Jack. She moved a step away from him, cleared her throat, then stuck out her right hand for him to shake. I enjoyed our little trick, Jack, she said, but I really need to get on home. It was very nice meeting you. Good luck in Lawrence. Hope you make your goal before moving on. Jack regarded her hand for a moment before sighing and taking it in his own. His strong grip was firm but not painful, and he held her fingers for a moment too long before releasing her. Bye, Miss Forestina, he said. Thanks for your help. You're quite a gal. I'm glad you think so, she replied. Goodbye. She walked away, but after a few seconds, glanced over her shoulder to see if he was watching her go. She just couldn't resist. He was, and when he saw her, he smiled widely and waved. She didn't wave back, just picked up her pace, scolding herself for being an idiot as she went along. Later that night, though, tossing and turning in her lonely twin-sized bed, she was distracted by thoughts of Jack's pecan eyes, his gleaming teeth, the feel of his strong hands on hers, and the way he lifted that rube off his feet as if he weighed nothing. But it wasn't just Jack who disturbed her normally peaceful sleep. She also thought about the way the crowd at the game had responded to her performance and how good it had felt to hear their laughter and applause. 
As she rolled over, punching at her lumpy pillow viciously, trying to get comfortable, she realized that she was tired of staying in one place and bored stiff with playing it safe. She shifted to her back and stared at the white plaster ceiling. Feeling the old familiar stirrings to be out and on pull at her like the moon tugging at the ocean. When Jack showed up at her diner the next day, as she knew he would, Forestina poured him a cup of black coffee, set a huge slice of butterscotch pie in front of him, its two inch high meringue quivering and sweating golden beads, and announced, I just quit my job, so you think I can get a place with your outfit? He grinned widely in response and called for an extra four. So, um, that's chapter 12. Um, He called me after they did a, a piece on me in the Democrat, Arkansas Democrat Gazette and called and wanted to tell me that he knew White River Red and he knew where her bar was and if I would come and meet him and the missus, he'd be happy to take me up there. Well, I haven't had a chance to do that, but it was in Hinesville, is around where he lives. So that area, um, I'm definitely going to take him up on it, uh, but um, that, that is as far, around that area is what I have heard. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Did she have any kids or other family? She did not. No, she did not. She did have sisters, um, but as far as we know, once she left to run away from the circus, she really didn't have that much to do with the family after that. So, and she never did have any kids. Yeah. Anyone? She was a great character. You know, I often think oh, if she could read it, she was, she was, I, I was three years old when she died. Uh, she died in 1973. So I, I think she would, might read this book and go, that is nothing, that is nothing like <laughs> it happened. But um, I hope she would see it as a, as a love letter because I really did love this character so much. Um, I don't know, not, I don't think terribly long. Um, there was a, a person that lived with her at the time, which I didn't include him in my book because there was a, there really wasn't a, a point for him in my book. But um, as far as I know, he was a, an old carnival guy and he helped get her affairs in order. If you had um, newspapers from that time, they do have the auction where they auctioned off all of her stuff in the newspaper. Um, and they said that she was um, um, not in incompetent. I can't remember the word that they used. But um, basically, they sold all her stuff so that she would move into the I invented the nursing home name <laughs> because I know she died in a nursing home. And I know it was a state nursing home. But I thought, I don't want to get into whether or not this was a real place and having to. So. I just Yes, ma'am. Oh, my mother told a story about uh, she had taken uh, one of the children into the doctor in Springdale, and uh, um, White River Red, while she was waiting, White River Red walked in with another woman and a child, and uh, she took the little child, the child was sick, and uh, she went over to the nurse. And she said, um, 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 take care of them, and I will take care of the bill. And then she left. Mm -hmm. And so she, she must have been a very tender-hearted woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's what drew me to her, uh, the fact that, first of all, like I said, she sort of lived 
life by her own rules, which I admire. But I also, yeah, that generosity of spirit. And she really did just sort of have this attitude that, you know, not wanting to be thanked to me says that she just saw it as her duty as a human being, not something, you know, she didn't do it to get thanks. She didn't do it to get attention. It was just if someone is hurting or needs food or needs medical care, it's my job to step in and do it if I can help. So I, I, I like that attitude. So. I think she also had a junk store in Bedvale, didn't she? I, her place was real junky along the, along. she had a place in Springdale that, I remember Pa pointing at, saying, that's where old White River Red used to live. And she had all kinds of animals, and she had a, a baboon for a while. She just, uh, she was apparently quite the colorful character. Um, but, yeah, sold, she sold fruit out of her truck and wood, and, you know, she just sort of lived a sort of transient I don't think she ever did a nine to five job. It was pretty much, um, you know, what, what, jobs that she wanted to do. So hard. I mean, a hard life. It wasn't an easy life, but. Yes, Mr. Renee. You said you went to an event at the Shiloh Museum about her. What prompted them to feature her? In so that auction that I told you about that was in the, in the newspaper, uh, I, apparently the man who had bought her Wheel of Chance had donated it to the museum system, and so they had it at the Shiloh Museum for a while. And so they were sort of doing this, you know, featuring this, because, you know, that Shiloh Museum is all about the Ozark history. Um, and so they had that exhibition, and so they thought, oh, you know, it'd be fun is if we have people who actually remember White River Red. And that, I think, was in 2016 is when they had that event, so um, a few years back. But, yeah, that's, that was kind of what prompted that, so. How many, how many were at this, this um, meeting? Well, it was a long time ago, so I don't, re I don't remember exactly. I remember it was a room full, but the rooms were very small. So I'm going to say like 25 people maybe. It's felt, it felt pretty full. Um, and there were just, like I said, delightful. This, this one little old lady reached over and said, Now, honey, how do you know anything about White River Red? And I said, Well, I don't. That's why I'm here. My grandpa told me about her. So, so. Anyway, um, so my book is, I have some books for sale. Um, it's also available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and bookstores around the area. Two Friends over in Bentonville carries it, Chapters on Maine and Van Buren. Um, I am is gonna start carrying it. Um, the Barnes and Noble and Rogers and I think the Barnes and Noble here in Fayetteville also have copies, so. In, in the bookstores, um, it's available, obviously, if it's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, there's hardback, paperback, Kindle, and Nook, and here is something exciting. If you're an Audible person, my agent told me just a few weeks ago that um, Tantor Media uh, bought the rights to the book, and so they're going to be making an audio version of the book, and they sent me a little snippet of the voice actress. Thank goodness I don't have to read. <laughs> Uh, she's great. She's got this nice, soft Southern, and it sounds real Southern. It doesn't sound like someone from the North. You're an audio person um, when that's released. That, that's kind of, a, I'm an audio person. I've always got like a physical book. Exercise makes me want to exercise. Like, I don't want to go for a walk, but I'm in that really good place in the book. <laughs> so I will go. So anyway, pretty soon. Um, you can see my website. Like I said, sometimes I talk about different things about books or Halloween's coming up. So I'll probably talk about my favorite scary books and that kind of stuff. I have uh, free bookmarks out there. If you want to pick those up, they have that information. Um, and... Um, if you want to sign up for the newsletter, like I said, I try to, I'm trying to make it more like if people have stories about colorful Ozark characters, I'd like to throw that in there. Some 
recipes from the books, which, I mean, my first newsletter, I taught how to make a spam, a fried spam sandwich because it's one of the characters' favorites. So you're not gonna get high cuisine. <laughs> it's just stuff that sort of has to deal with, with the um, character. So anyway, that's, that's all I've got. You guys have any more questions or comments? Thank you so much for, for coming out. And um, I'll be sitting out here if you have any questions. If you're shy about asking questions in public, you can come over there and talk to me. I, I understand. Like I said, I teach, I teach for a living. So uh, I, know how, I know how intimidating it can be to talk in class sometimes. So, anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you.